this. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for, for this. Um, the, uh, when you do commit yourself to a talk like this, there's normally many months to go. And when it comes to the time, you usually need to be somewhere else. So today I should be in two other countries, but I'm here, made a commitment. I, quite, I don't do many of these, but I quite like the um, discipline of having to think. Um, so from my own point of view, being very selfish, it gives me an opportunity to think about things, which um, in a busy uh, life that we all uh, uh, share uh, is quite hard. And um, so this is a collection of thoughts, really, that um, may or may not join together, but you'll be the judge of that. Um, maybe partly because it's inspired by, by Velux. My thoughts went to up there. Uh, light comes from above. Um, uh, maybe thinking of roof lights, but um, certainly nature provides it there. God, Buddha, or whoever you believe in, put it up there, and it comes down. And I've always had a, an instinctive dislike for uplighting. It seems to be completely unnatural and very strange. And even as a small child, I had a problem with uplighting. Um, but lighting coming from above um, is something that happens on, on everywhere in the world. Um, but it happens in different ways with different intensities. Um, I'm going to show a project here, to, uh, one at the end, two recently completed projects, which look at daylighting in another way. This is the United Arab Emirates uh, Pavilion at the Expo in Milan. Um, and this is a, uh, an unusual building, not for its form or its shape necessarily, but it's going to be transported back to Abu Dhabi following um, the expo, which is a rare thing um, in these expos that get built. It's creeping in more into big sporting activities where the, the, the legacy of what you actually build survives. And I think in 2020, the expo that will be in, in Dubai will actually keep the buildings as a permanent condition, but this was the first time that we formally designed, as it were, from the very beginning, a building that was intended to move. The previous one we did uh, in Shanghai was moved back, but it wasn't designed to be. That happened rather later. And the expos I've discovered are a kind of, uh, probably, I think, the dumbest method of communication in the world. Um, I think that this is the PowerPoint for me up until my thoughts about the expo, the dumbest method of communication in the world. It's, it has to be really simple. It can only really take very simple, very powerful ideas. Anything that gets complex on here, people go to sleep. I've watched them and I've lost audiences and I've lost clients in the past who nod off on the fourth diagram. You know, it really is dumb. But the expo is very, very similar. People work incredibly hard to communicate everything about their country to you and you just walk by. And after about four visits, fatigue sets in. So really, it's only the kind of really simple, powerful things that will actually get to you, which is an interesting observation. Here, given the fact that it will go back to the Middle East in a very kind of hot and very bright environment, one of the things that we've learned through Mazdar and other projects, and if you look back in history over thousands of years, any development that's occurred naturally in these locations and evolved really builds the buildings very close together. And obviously there are many reasons for that, not least of which some of them to do with defense. But the idea of building things very close together also provides a lot of shade. And if, as we did, you go to these ancient cities and you actually take readings, level temperature readings, and things, you realize it's a lot cooler inside there. And also other things begin to happen, like natural airflow from one side to the other. Um, and the idea of an expo is to try and communicate something of the country that you're representing um, to the rest of the world. So in some ways you can come here and you can, and you can visit it. So <clears throat> in the center of that space there is a, a point where you're shown a film. That's their simple way of doing it. It's a very um, impressive event that a large number of people have actually put together. And from that uh, metal drum in the middle you can see light bounces and reflects off it through there. Now we, we actually developed these panels um, from the desert. We went out into, uh, into the Emirates and actually scanned the sand. And then with our very clever guys in the office, they managed to make uh, and get that natural patterning and transform it into a panelized system that we could build. And obviously, as you move through the space, it's meant to induce some of the feeling of what it might be like to be, to be in the desert. 
and it does provide shade in various locations as you move through. And if you've been to an expo, you know you're going to spend quite a bit of time in a queue. And therefore, there will be um, sometimes there where you'll sit quite naturally in the shade. And what I like about this photograph is this, this lady on the end, look. She's very precisely in the shadow. I mean, everybody else is. But she's not out of it. She's actually in the shadow. People subconsciously actually kind of go uh, for things like that um, instinctively. Um, and therefore, using shade, walls very close together. They're 12 meters high and vary in, obviously, width as you move backwards and forwards. And this will still be the case when it goes back to Abu Dhabi and to using the shade. There's obviously some interior um, spaces there as well. But light um, in architecture can do other things. And we, it can be a communicator of where outside is. So if you're in a situation such as this, which is an underground station not too far from here, uh, and if you're down underground, 20 meters in this instance, and you get out of the train, um, there's a terrible dependency in London Underground on the, on the signage because it takes you backwards and forwards, changes your orientation, everything. Here, what we tried to do was say, well, I'm going to get out of the train. I'm going to see an escalator. It's fairly obvious I'm going to get on the escalator because there are other people there. And if light at the end is there visible, it's very clearly that's where you go. That's where you get out to. So this is very definitely trying to think about using light as communicating direction and where to go. And also, very importantly, the source of light, which is usually letting into buildings of glass in one shape or form, isn't really where the light is. It's what the light hits that really is very important, all those solid pieces of fabric around there. So using the light to bring into the space to hit the solid rather than relying on just the, the beauty of glass, if you, uh, if you like that, is something that I think is a, a passion for us and something that we try and work on with all, with all projects. And lighting can also, daylighting can also be from above um, quite playful. Um, you can have a bit of fun with it and you can create a sense of drama. Um, <clears throat> so this hotel here in central London in the Oldwich, at its centre, has uh, the check-in to the hotel on the first floor. The, the owners wanted to actually bring you in, invite you in and take you up to that first floor. So at the bottom of uh, an atrium space, a solid atrium space going all the way up to the top, is this check-in reception. And light comes down from above through this very narrow opening, down through the walls at the various times of the day, changes the mood and the atmosphere. And it's quite interesting, when you reduce your palette down to something as basic as this, the effect of the light and the way change comes becomes incredibly much more noticeable um, and more potent. So strangely, using less light um, in very theatrical ways as this can be can be very, very potent. And in other parts of the world, this is, the, this is in Saudi Arabia, where we're building four uh, railway stations uh, for the knowledge cities. Um, Saudi, a bit like Abu Dhabi, is obviously very bright, very, very potent place, very hot. Um, the sun is something to be feared, is an enemy. You want to be out of it, not in it. Um, not, you know, Northern Europeans love to be in the sun. Everybody down there wants to hide away from it. So it's somehow an evil enemy. And I think it's kind of interesting about the use of glass in, in this part of the world. There's an obsession with glass um, in all architecture in many, many locations. And it's very hard to get even architects to think about not using glass. So one of the disciplines we said here was imagine there isn't any glass or imagine the glass is so expensive. It really is expensive. You've got to actually use it to you know, the best degree and that way Predominantly, the building goes, goes more solid. So the roof structure here has these little tiny roof lights um, that let in light, and again, can be at times very theatrical. And the relatively small amounts of light that come through are more than adequate to light the whole space. So this is still under construction, so we don't have the great photographs yet, but you can begin to see the effect on the ground there. And if you're in that space, although it's very bright over there and not here, the overall ambience is actually very, very even lighting. Um, and it's something that, again, is about this climate, is about this place. If we were building this in Northern Europe, of course, we wouldn't do this design. It has to be something that is designed quite specifically and appropriate to that, to that climate. But small amounts of light, again, in a very theatrical way. And this also um, in the Middle East, um, you know, with a, a kind of a, a very densely planned uh, shopping retail experience. This is the souk part of it in Abu Dhabi. 
central, central markets, um, with roof light coming down through many, <coughs> many stories to the base of the, of the space. Um, and an area like this, such as an internal courtyard with an, an openable roof. Um, and at night, you can see this is what that space is like. Up, up at the top there, the roof is now closed. And you can see the transformation that just by letting the light in and being able to open it and close it, kind of for five months of the year, this is like being in the Mediterranean, so it can be open and the airflow can come in. And those other months, it's very hot and therefore can close down. Um, but that, seeing that transformation, one to the other, is, is quite magical. And it's something that people don't normally get the opportunity to do. Um, but the, transformating, the transformation nature of light through there, and again, hitting solid surfaces, is something that we're always um, particularly fascinated by. Um, <clears throat> and light from above um, in other functioning buildings such as this. This is the Queen Alia Airport uh, in Jordan. Um, and we've been looking at airports now for a long time, and, and top light, bringing light from above. Obviously, you can have a relatively small percentage up there and get a huge amount of light. And big open areas such as airports are very, are very good for that. So here, <coughs> in between this crisscross pattern, these large concrete shelves, light comes uh, within, the, within the gaps and uh, provides the quality of light that you can see in the airport. And it's very interesting that the observant amongst you will notice the electric lights are on, um, even though the daylight is more than adequately doing its job. And I find it unbelievable, even in our own office, I have to confess, um, which we've now managed to, to fix. But the effort, the effort that you have to put in to get people to understand about turning the lights off, it's just something that nobody thinks about, nobody even notices. And it's on all the time. And you'll see a lot of these photographs. I try to pick some images with the lights off. It's quite hard. <laughs> Another shot through here. And then <clears throat> um, thinking about light in a way that um, this project in Omaha, Nebraska, houses the building on the right-hand side, which you might be surprised about. Um, the one on the left-hand side was built in 1920s. This is our first building in the United States, and it's quite modest for a first building in the United States. Um, but this was the right solution, um, so that's why we did it. But it really um, was the point where we started to think a lot about separating out the sun and skylight. And if you mentally separated those two things out, well, what, where, what would it lead to? And within an art gallery here, this is the, the new building and the old building there, and between the two is the circulation space where, of course, light can flood in. Light can come in. There's no art in there. There's nothing that uh, can, be, uh, can be damaged by it. Um, so it can be a very generous amount of light that comes through and creates dramatic spaces in those circulation areas. But in the gallery spaces, it has to be very religiously controlled, as many of you know, um, not least of which you won't be able to borrow any art from any other gallery unless it is very controlled. <clears throat> and here we try to bring in natural light and bounce it around in the space to get what is effectively a very even distri distribution at lower level. By the corners of these vaults, light comes in, bounces off of a reflector onto the ceiling, and by the time it gets down there, it's very uh, diffused. And this piece at the top here, um, that little curving roof light where the window is vertical and the, the roof is curved, the curved keeps out the sun and the glass goes after sky. And it was this project that actually kind of led us to think about what we might do on the top of the Reichstag. The idea of saying, well, the Reichstag is in a location, it has the tear garden in front of it, there's no high rise around, you've effectively got a whole hemisphere to be able to, to look at. And we all know that light from above is more potent than it is from the edge, but there's such a quantity here. What could we do? Could we actually find a way of, of redirecting the light? And we're working with our lighting consultant, Claude Engel. Um, we actually proved to ourselves, first of all, him on a beach in Washington and me in the basement of my flat with a mirror um, pointing at daylight and actually showing that I could put light into the shadow. You can't focus it, but you can certainly redirect it. And that's the simple principle that we actually adopted for here. How can we do that? And the sun is screened out by that device that you can see on the left-hand side that actually tracks around. So this is an array of mirrors that actually goes for the sky and not the sun. Um, that 
um, screen, as you can see, it was calculated, moves all the way around, and it was an incredibly calculated, engineered story. An actual fact, when we were doing it and balancing it, it became very, very simple and obvious. Just point the mirror where the light is, and it works. It was not something that we needed to necessarily have done a huge amount of calculation for, but nevertheless, that's the, what you learn as, as going through the process. Um, and that comes down through and into the, the main chamber of the building. And as you'll see here, the lights are on. <laughs> this is a different reason. Apparently, television doesn't like natural light. It hates it it's with a vengeance. So every single minute, and this is actually an orchestra. I only noticed that this morning, actually. There's an orchestra playing in the bottom of there, rather than being the politicians. Um, but <clears throat> every single minute when the politicians are talking here, it's all filmed. So the lights are on all the time. But the quality of light is such that um, everybody enjoys it. And even the people up on the balcony over there at the back, we were getting direct sunlight. That sunscreen, we cheated a bit. It doesn't actually shut out all the sun. It lets a bit through. And we always had a contingency to go back that if it was a problem, we'd cover it up and add more shading to it. And that was agreed with the client. But so far, nobody's ever complained. And they quite like the sun actually hitting the chamber in relatively small amounts. And this uh, project, which is under construction and has been stopped start an awful lot in Abu Dhabi, this is the Zayed National Museum, is something, again, thinking about that very powerful light in the desert and how could we work with it, how could we harness it in some way into a museum. Sheikh Zayed, who this building is in honour for, um, was a Bedouin. He actually lived outside most of his life in the wild. Um, you've got to remember that Dubai and Abu Dhabi didn't exist in the 1960s. It was all created then. Um, so the connection and the awareness of light, heat, and all those things in the natural environment was something that's very, very potent. It's life or death in, in that kind of uh, uh, way. And that's how he grew up and did various things, trying to uh, plant trees with a view to modifying the climate. So the idea of doing a building to, to celebrate him, uh, we felt should in some ways try and harness those natural, um, natural phenomena of heat. So these sculptural, highly symbolic wings on the top here, it's about 120 meters to the tallest one, designed to heat up at the top to get as hot as possible up there and then connect into the airspace down below. And we bring air through the ground, through what's known as a Canadian duct, through and up into the space and naturally ventilate it and use the wings as an engine to draw the air through the building. Quite advanced. And in the process of doing that, also let different types of natural light in. And here we wanted to try and treat lighting as an essay, if you like, on a big scale. So some of these shots, like here, for example, there's relatively clear glass lower down at the bottom of those wings that will let light into the sculptural forms. These are the underside of the gallery spaces um, up above. And you know, through the day, this transforms quite dramatically. Um, and obviously, at sunset, you get a very different quality of light coming through here as well. Um, <coughs> and this is the, one of those wings and one of the galleries inside. And what we wanted to do was let a small amount of daylight into the galleries, into those pods. So we're actually getting, trying to capture tiny amounts of direct sunlight at different times of the day and let them come through and actually hit, do that uh, dangerous thing of letting some sunlight into a gallery space, but do it in a very controlled way. And this is probably our most developed um, project in terms of trying to think about how we can use daylight in its different forms. The rest of the wing, as well as being performing from an air point of view, also produces um, uh, uh, light, but a very even light. When uh, the, the material there is glass, and it's going to screen out an awful lot of, uh, of the natural light, but just to give a gentle glow in that upper wing. Um, this shows uh, another version of all of that. And um, in order to, to do all this with the computers today, we can do amazing things. And this has all been through all the calculations. But it's still a point in history where I don't think anybody really can fully trust all those calculations. They need verification. In our world, architectural world, we need to be sure that things are going to work. So we've, we've built a one to five model of one of these galleries. And everything that we've calculated on the computer will now rerun in real time um, on the site here in, in Abu Dhabi. This is a one to five 
uh, model there. One to five is a good enough scale to actually give you pretty accurate readings for all sorts of things, acoustics, performance, and lighting as well. Um, so we'll be measuring and checking our computer work and all the analysis that the engineers have been doing um, and make the final selection with, in physical reality, such as here. And then the thoughts went to a different type of light. Um, and I tried to think where we actually consciously used light from the very beginning of the thought process. And this is the, the library at the Free University in Berlin. Um, and here we were very uh, scientific about it. It's, it's the, the, the form of the building is trying to be as small as it can possibly be. Um, it's a very large library that the Free University have and it had to go inside it. And in the process, we also restored all of the original 1960s, 1970s uh, fabric, which was rusting away, um, and created this new, this new center in here. And we thought, what, what would a library, what do you want in a library? You've got to study. It's there for students who are going to be working and studying. And what, what kind of light and what kind of experience should they get? It, and we felt that it, there ought to be distractions, but they ought to be relatively minor. And if we could give a very even type of light on the inside um, and allow glimpses of the outside world so you know it's raining or whatever, um, that for us, we thought, was the best kind of vehicle for study. You could go in a completely blank box, but you need something to be aware of the world outside. It needs that careful balance, and that's what we were pursuing uh, with this project here. Um, <coughs> and that led to this um, double skin uh, structure where this is a fabric liner on the inside that gives you the translucent glow uh, and air moves through the cavity between the two and there are solid and glazed panels on the outside and they open up and they naturally ventilate and do all that but the driving thing was originally was what the quality of light should be in such a space is it somewhere where you can study it seems to be fairly popular these photographs were taken not long after the opening and I'm told if you're not there by 11 o'clock you don't get a seat um, and other universities have been banned from coming here because everybody was coming here because of the, the nature of the space. So it clearly touched some resonance with, uh, with those people. And the translucently and light coming through is something that, you know, in architecture historically and today is still something that we, uh, we like to, to work with and play with. Um, and here, this is the Supreme Court in Singapore um, where <coughs> we managed to bring a lot of natural light in through uh, the central space down to ground level. Um, but really also the, the outside walls, we use this sort of lamination of very thin stone and glass together, um, which is normally if you use a translucent panel, and I can't, there aren't really many around here at the moment like doing that, but um, whatever the side the light is on looks quite boring. On the inside, during the day, it looks fantastic because everything glows. And on the outside, at night, it looks great. But the opposite way around, it can look very flat and dead. So here, we very consciously chose the strong graining in the, in the marble. as effectively tears, very thin sections of marble to actually work and be visible from both sides during the, during the day and the night. Um, <clears throat> and this is another... Um, interesting thing about the kind of small amounts of light and, translucently, and translucency. This was a, a house that we did in Japan. And at the end there, you can see behind the Buddha, uh, there are these sort of glass bricks. This is the opposite end of the space. And we wanted to try and get something that wasn't tissue paper, not shoji, it's in Japan, but something that we could use. And we didn't really want the, the flat glass that I was mentioning before. So we, we tried to find a way of doing it. And the idea of making glass blocks led us on a very interesting journey all the way back to here in London, where we found this company um, recycling cathode ray tubes. Do you remember those? Well, actually, you don't, you don't see them at all, do you? Anymore? They've all completely gone. But they were recycled. A lot of them were recycled into making these blocks and made under the railway arches here in London and transported out to Japan. So it's quite an interesting experience of making materials to allow light to come through. I think that's a fascination which we'll probably do more of in the future. Um, and seeing from the inside to the outside uh, is something that we can't really do anymore. Um, glass is such, and I'll explain in a minute, has changed so much that you don't really see in anymore from outside. So consciously trying to do that, this is the pyramid, um, working with Brian Clark, the artist, um, um, to uh, produce this focal point right at the top of the space. This is the 
palace of peace. The president of Kazakhstan actually every two years gets the world's religious leaders together to talk uh, about peace. And he's the only one in the world that does it. It's quite interesting, isn't it? Kazakhstan. Mm. What do you all think of Kazakhstan? Kazakhstan. This is the only guy who actually has got the nerve to actually get the world's religions together to talk. And it happens in this building. So I find quite interesting. And here they are all uh, discussing whatever they're discussing. Um, but again, the quality of light <coughs> coming down through the space transforms itself through the day um, and adds to the kind of spectacle of it. This is the, the stained glass at the top. There are doves of peace up in there woven in from Brian. Um, and seeing it from the outside, if you really want to, you have to be incredibly um, inventive and also a bit lucky. Um, and this was a project at uh, the Johnson Wax building in Wisconsin. And it's to celebrate and honor this aircraft, which was very important to their family. They make polish, yeah, always have done. And uh, the founder of the company bought an airplane exactly like that and flew down to Brazil um, to actually see his natural products occurring and created research centers and things like that. Uh, and came back and eventually died and the sons took over. The plane was sold and crashed and the family learned to scuba dive just because they knew where it had crashed and tried to find it and couldn't. It later was found by somebody else. So what they decided to do was rebuild a new one completely, which they did from scratch. And then the family flew down to Brazil and reenacted the, the founder's uh, flight. So for the company, it's quite a symbolic thing. And they wanted everybody to see it on the site and to see it, which means that it's got to be inside because it's protected. So how the hell do you do that? Well, <coughs> this is actually very, very clear glass. Um, and it has to be very clear glass in order to be able to see through. And it doesn't work unless you actually put light on the other side with great um, quantities. You'll never ever get the same amount of light inside as you do outside. But here the big roof light is trying to light up this aeroplane. So when you're outside, you can see it from the outside. Um, you know, and it's single glazed in northern America, which is always very bad. I mean, the fact that we can tell you it's already um, uh, it's nuclear powered, the entire state, um, which means it did manage to get a lead rating, which I, you know, is an interesting discussion. Um, <coughs> and obviously, separate from this is the staff canteen that they, that they all use. But the idea to go to these measures, to actually be able to see something from the outside through glass, you know, leads me to a little rant that I've kind of have, and I've got from this thinking about this talk. Um, this is our office. Um, built about 25 years ago. Um, and at the time, it complied with the codes that were relevant, it had to, it was built by a developer, and they're not prepared to do anything more than the code, which shows you the importance of code, and also shows you how things have moved on, because you can actually see in. This is from the other side of the river. You can actually see in. <laughs> um, that was glass then. Glass now, this is another building uh, that we built in New York. This is what glass looks like now, it's dark. The good news is the performance is incredible. It's been developed. It's actually worked very well. You can actually control um, the daylight and the heat build up in there. The downside is it tends to come out dark or reflective. And that's where glass is. So glass, I don't find beautiful anymore. Um, and you have to rely on the metalwork here to actually be your architecture. Yeah? Now, a lot of people get very critical of all glass buildings. Um, and you know, it's a, it was a fashionable thing, particularly a couple of years ago, to knock the idea of all glass buildings. I actually don't particularly like all glass buildings, and even more so now that glass is very boring. Um, but, you know, is it right? Are they right to say the, these are gas guzzlers? There are something which, you know, we shouldn't be, be doing anymore. It's the 20th century, we're now the 21st. We'll have much more solid panels on the outside, and that naughty glass is real really should be banned from here on in. Um, <coughs> so I use this as a chance to sort of sit for an hour or so with one of our engineers and quiz him about stuff. And um, obviously, if you're in a space such as this, which could be anywhere in Europe, a relatively shallow uh, plan space, if you look at the functioning light, and a bit like you were saying earlier on, you know, it's really only the perimeter that gets it. So if you have two perimeters close together, then obviously you can get a lot of functional light. Um, you have to notice the lights are on as well, again. But 
they don't need to be because you can get so much daylight coming from either side. And in such a shallow um, plan as this, this bottom bit doesn't really do anything for you anyway. Um, it doesn't give you any added light, and clearly the views are all, are all uh, um, prevalent. But the way life is going is to go forever deeper plans. Um, and what we've discovered through our workplace analysis group in the office that researches things all the time is a big tendency to go for bigger floor plates around the world. And the reason is that more people need to be closer to each other to communicate because the tasks that we're all working on are much harder and they can't be done by one brain in one office. They have to be connecting and many, many more people need to connect, need to be close to each other and therefore the floor plates are getting bigger. So it's going in the opposite direction if you like, from a daylighting point of view. So what you find is this would be the effect in an office building today, um, where really, if there is any functioning light, it's purely over just this six meters or so from the edge. And the rest of it is what we would call a submarine. And a submarine because everything has got to be supplied to you. Air's got to be supplied to you. Light's got to be supplied to you. It might as well be in a submarine because that's really what it is. So what about this floor to ceiling glass? Um, well, <coughs> again, started to look at a space, and with the engineers, I said, well, look, if you're going to create an office space, and that's 100% energy, where does it all go? Where do, where do we put it? Well, we put 12 to 15% on the glass on the outside, maybe as much as 20 in some locations, maybe less in others, dependent on the depth of the space and all the other factors. But for the sake of this conversation, that's a 12 to 15% problem. The lighting, however, is 25 now, our architects, you know, spend a huge amount of time on that wall over there. It might have a massive amount of time on it. Uh, and quite often, we don't do the lighting. If you're doing a speculative office building, the architect will never do the interior. So you never get the chance for it. But 25% of the energy consumed is in those lights. Hmm, what should our research center on? Probably this, because the real big burner is the plug load is all the stuff that comes in. Now, in our world, and with these deeper floor plates, the other thing that's happening is we're doing an incredible amount more processing. And every 1% one can save on that external wall is instantly used up by more processing capacities, capacity in the office. So where should, and we're lucky to have researchers, where should we focus our attention? Well, clearly, we're going to be doing a lot of attention on this 30%, and probably a lot on the 25%. Um, and less on the wall, because that glass, that glass, and if it does go floor to ceiling, the one advantage it has is if the, with the ever-deepening floor plate, if you're the unfortunate one to be in the middle and far away, at least there's some sort of psychological uh, connection to the outside world. And there, that extra bit of glass going down to the ground is probably giving you a little something, uh, and it's not penalising you that much. Just an interesting way of thinking. And then coming to... The final two projects, I was trying to think, well, knowing all that and having gone through it, what, would, what works, what could you do? Clearly, lighting in a tower, daylighting in a tower is quite restrictive. You can do things, you can do atria spaces, and you can do all that which we're exploring in other projects, but uh, it's, it's quite hard to actually get a quality of light. If you stay lower, and this is McLaren, um, then clearly, you know, you have a big roof area, light can come uh, from above and in this case also from the lake, and light bounces off and reflects on the underside of their front of house area where they display all their cars. Um, and, and inside, light does come through the roof, through relatively small roof lights. Again, the lights are on, um, but <coughs> with daylight coming from above. And in the, in the main space, we've developed this sort of cooled ceiling system, and daylighting and artificial light combined into these vaults which at the time with fluorescent lighting, and this was really the end of the fluorescent era from our point of view, um, really makes sense where you, you know, an ambient and a down light component is probably the best you're gonna get from a fluorescent source. Of course, it's all now totally changed with, um, with the introduction of LEDs. But here you can see with the lights off, I think, um, <coughs> the daylit space in their, in their working area at McLaren. And then the final project, which was, uh, opened earlier this year, um, we call Banco. It's in Argentina, and it was the headquarters for a bank. And one thing about our industry is that people change so fast these days. We have many projects that when they're completed, there is nobody 
other than us around. Everybody's moved on, the project managers, everybody. Um, and in this one, right at the end, the whole client moved on. They decided not to move in and they gave it to the local government. So it became a local government office, not a bank. <laughs> Kind of, how do you, anyway, it's flexible, so it was all right. But this one, I think, is three stories, so it's higher than McLaren, McLaren goes underground. Um, but using this concrete roof and roof lights and, and glazing that's heavily shaded, um, we try to create an environment in here which is filled with light, and maybe with health and all the issues that you're going to be talking about later on. This might be one of the ways that um, buildings should go. And I'm not saying this is unique, there are a lot of buildings around like that, but generous light, top light, side light, views out. Um, it feels a very popular place and certainly the government officials have moved in and are delighted. Um, you see here over the, the three stories coming down, concrete shells. Um, and it's a, a great place to work. And in the, this culture, there's a tradition of what uh, they call patios. So it's like a light well from our point of view, but coming all the way down from to ground level, landscape gardening, obviously just started here. Um, so that's really my thoughts. Thank you very much. <laughs>